Last week, we taught about covenant lessons. Just to remind you of the subject matter last week, that there are covenants in the Bible. We as dispensationalists believe in those covenants as well. Uh, it's just that we believe that God does not always deal with humanity through covenants, which is to say, specifically in this dispensation, we're not under the covenants of God, which were given to Israel specifically in the Bible. We are under this dispensation of grace, a part of the body of Christ, a new creature. And when I say those things, people who aren't familiar with that position think that I'm saying nothing different than what the new covenant says, and that is incorrect. Um, that is, uh, the new creature is not the new covenant. It's a different positional truth. But that's another lesson for another day. <clears throat> We've been covering the covenants then. <clears throat> we covered the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the new covenant, all last week giving you a definition of what those are. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> this morning, I would like to cover a verse in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. A common objection <clears throat> to the idea that we are not Israel and we have no part of their covenants is the book of Galatians. <clears throat> Which I find somewhat ironic because Galatians has as its theme <clears throat> Showing that we are not justified by the law, or being Israel, or by circumcision. In Galatians 3, verse 29, it says, If ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. <clears throat> Is Abraham our father? That's a question. Are we Abraham's seed? The verse says we are, or at least the Galatians are, and they're part of the body of Christ, aren't they? Some people are confused by that and say, well, maybe they're not, you know, because they see that conflict. Why is Abraham our father? Like, how's that exactly? <clears throat> because we can't trace our lineage biologically back to Abraham. And why does Paul talking about Abraham, the seed of Abraham, in Romans 4, talk about Abraham being our father? The verse says, we are heirs according to the promise. What do we inherit exactly? It says, we're heirs according to the promise. What is the promise exactly? There's lots of questions in this verse. But it seems in some way to tie us to Abraham and Israel is what people assume and make that judgment on. So I want to talk about that this morning, Abraham's seed, what that means for you. And as a subtitle, why the nation of Israel has three fathers, uh, which is part of the answer to this, okay? Abraham isn't the only father of Israel. There's Isaac and there's Jacob, right? Abraham had the promise of God to have a son. He did. Isaac was the promised son. Then Isaac was given a promise to have a seed, and he did. He had twins, right? And then Jacob was promised to have a nation, and he did. He had 12 men, which would be 12 tribes of, the, uh, tribes, of, uh, tribes of Israel. And so that's how the nation of Israel began. And the Bible talks about the fathers of the nation of Israel, referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the fathers. And the promises given to those fathers that undergird Israel as a nation and God's promises to them as a people. Okay, we covered last week, just in brief, Genesis chapter 12, and that covenant that he first gave to Abraham when he called him out of his country and told him to go to a land that he would show him and he would make him a nation. So he's going to a land. He will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. So Abraham was promised a blessing from God, which if God promises to bless you, the uh, correct response is thank you, you know, uh, because that's great uh, to receive a good thing like a blessing from God. But that's not the end of the promise. I will bless you and make thy name great. So it's not just blessings that he's getting from God here. His name, Abraham, is going to be great. Uh, even in this world today, as fallen and wicked as it is, uh, people talk about the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, just a couple years ago, there was uh, agreements made with those in the Middle East called the Abrahamic Accords. Yeah. And it's like, why does his name keep coming up? There's a lot of people that trace themselves back to Abraham as far as spiritually speaking, religiously speaking. Even Islam goes back to Abraham. They disagree with you on Jesus and Mary and most of the Old Testament. But Abraham, in Islam, I wouldn't recommend it, but you can study Genesis 1 through 12 in Islam and get pretty much things close to right. Don't do it. Like I said, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but uh, they don't depart much from Christianity in that regard. What they depart, of course, is Ishmael and uh, other places in the Scripture. But he has a, a great name here, and thou shalt be a blessing. We covered this last week. It's not just that he gets a blessing, but he is a blessing to others. Well, that's something else entirely. Like, getting a blessing is good. Being a blessing, that's something else. 
I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Apparently Abraham is tied to all the families of the earth. That's interesting because he's not the first man or anything like that. Like Adam was the first man. But Abraham is given this, this blessing of promise here that all families of the earth shall be blessed through him. How? What's this talking about? A land, a seed, and a blessing is what God promised Abraham. Galatians, what's that to do with that? Is Galatians teaching that the church, the body of Christ, is now taking over the promises given to the fathers of Israel and is now Israel and is now in those covenants with Israel? Is that what it's saying? Um, or is it saying something else? How do dispensationalists, how do we as mid-Acts, Pauline dispensationalists, reconcile this? First of all, we should not miss the forest for the trees. We need to understand what Galatians is talking about. When you find a difficult passage in verse, you're looking at the verse, and it's good to read the words in the verse, and often we get stuck in that verse, and we just read it over and over and over again. And we can't see how to read it any different than what con contradicts your belief system. You're trying to solve it. You say, how do I comport this with what I, what I believe or think I believe? And you just read it over and over again. You say, I just can't make it line up. You ever been there? It's like, this is difficult. Uh, step number one at that moment, read around it. Yeah. right? Because the verse doesn't stand in isolation. And never does a, a difficult verse not get help from a context. And so if you don't know how to interpret a hard verse, read around it for more easier ones. And what you'll do is you'll form a thought bridge. This sounds very new agey of me. Right? But you'll get a theme, right? a thought going through the passage, and you can run right through that hard verse on a general idea. You may not be able to interpret the details of it. You say, well, he's talking about this, and then suddenly there's the hard verse, and he's talking about this. Well, how do you connect the things he's talking about? That might help you with the interpretation. And so in this regard, maybe we'll ask a big general question. What's Galatians talking about? What's the point of Galatians, just generally speaking? And this is much easier to determine. In fact, it's very hard to find commentaries, this side of the Vatican, that uh, get the general idea of Galatians wrong. Right? The specifics, of course, differ quite a lot, especially on this verse right here. But generally, people agree that Galatians is talking about you not being justified by the law. Right? It's talking about how you're justified. And the point Paul's making is it's not by the law. It's not by circumcision. It's not by your works. It's not by your flesh. And this is very hard to miss, reading Galatians. So if that's all the Bible study you can do, that is really helpful, folks, because that is very important information. Right? And so I encourage you to study the Bible on your own. Uh, if you come to hard passages, uh, attempt them, but that's not what determines your growth as much as the easier ones. You know, learn the easiest truths in the Scripture, and those are the foundation stones upon which your faith grows. Okay? So don't miss the forest for the trees. You're so focused on this one verse, you forget what the whole book is saying. Galatians is about how we're justified. And so if we, right up here, I'm going to use that side of the board later. You know, this idea of how we get blessed or justified, how do we get this determination of righteousness by God? How do we get blessed by God? How do we get justified by God? When we stand before God and he looks at us, how is it that he could say, that's justified, you're justified? How is that possible? The natural way to think about that is, well, if you do good and you don't do wrong, then you stand before the judge, he's going to say, well, you're free to go. You're justified, you're not a criminal, you haven't broken anything. The problem with that, of course, is that none of us are perfect. There's none righteous, right? We're all sinners. And so, thus the question, how do we get blessed by God if we're all sinners and unrighteous and not justified? Well, you would think the natural conclusion would be none of us get blessed by God. Well, that, of course, is contrary to what the Bible says when he says God's trying to bless Abraham and other people. So this is what Galatians is dealing with, is this question. The Galatians think, well, now that I've heard about Jesus Christ and I trust what he did, I'm going to walk this path of doing good works so that I can get greater blessing from God, so that I can justify myself over and above other people who don't do the good works. Right? It's legalism, as Christians say in their euphemisms. Right? It's this idea that you can get saved by Jesus, but walk under the law. No. That is not how you walk in righteousness today. That's not how you get righteousness today. That's not how you get blessed by God according to righteousness today. And this is what Galatians is dealing with. Look at Galatians 2. Paul rebukes Peter on this very point, which is why the, the account is mentioned. Galatians 2, 14. Remember Peter goes to Antioch, which is where Paul was ministering, by the way. Peter didn't lay this foundation here. Paul was ministering there. And Paul says, I withstood Peter to his face because he was to be blamed. Yeah. What an amazing verse. Yeah. 
Like Peter, the apostle, w walked on water, right? Followed Jesus when the other disciples didn't, when he was being tried, right? Peter, who was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew himself and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. So there was a separation they were making between Jew and Gentile. And Paul, that's not what Paul teaches. That's not what God's doing today. And so he rebukes him. Verse 14, when I saw that they walked not uprightly, look at this, they walked not uprightly. Now, here are these Jews who were separating themselves from sinners and Gentiles. According to God's law, you might think that looks like, I mean, Psalm 1, they'll stand in the counsel of the ungodly, right? Don't be around the unclean. God wanted Israel to be separate from the nations. Peter says in Acts 10, know you not it's unlawful for a Jew to keep company with a Gentile, right? Wouldn't it be a righteous thing under the law to say, well, you know what? Those are sinners over here. Jesus had something to say about that too, by the way. But Paul says they did not walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, the gospel he preaches. Because the gospel he preaches, there's none righteous. And there is no Jew and Gentile. And so the upright walk, the righteous walk, the justification of these people was determined on how they walked in line with what the gospel that Paul preached was. Okay. I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Wow! I mean, he wasn't like, Peter, let's talk here a little bit. I mean, he just went right into it. If you live like those guys, then why are you making them live like God tells you to live? Right? Wow. Just jumped right into it. And this is what he says to Peter. Um, verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Now, he's saying that in the context of a Jew to a Jew, right? Yeah. And so Peter knew what he's talking about. Other Jews know what he's talking about. But it's really offensive to us Gentiles, right? N not that it's untrue. But he's saying here, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners, the Gentiles. What's that imply? The Jews are sinners, right? Well, according to God's promise and covenants, they were chosen. They had a promise of blessing. Those Gentiles didn't have a promise of blessing. They were without God and without hope. So this is the distinction he's talking about. He says, you who are Jews, you know, we who are Jews by nature, by the flesh. You know, we're not sinners like the Gentiles. You always hear the sarcasm in Paul's voice here because he's going to go on to say there's no Jew or Gentile. This sounds very similar, by the way, to the argument Paul uses in Romans 3. Remember Romans 3? The Gentiles understand, and so are the Jews. Right? In Romans 2, he says, if you guys are circumcised and, and you guys are teaching the law, but you break the law, what good is that? Remember? So it's, it's not an old argument. Galatians 2.16 says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, just like Romans 3 taught as well. Look, this is not new information. He's reminding Peter, however, that, look, this is the gospel I'm preaching here at Antioch, and you're not walking uprightly according to it, which Peter ought to have respected that, already acknowledging that God gave Paul a gospel for the uncircumcision. Okay, in Galatians chapter 2, he'll say that. Galatians 2.16, I have to mention just briefly here, the small controversy, which is no small controversy for some people, about the faith of Christ, where it says, by the faith of Christ we're, uh, we're justified, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. We might be justified by the faith of Christ. People say, well, that's Jesus Christ exercising faith, having faith, right? Him personally having faith in God. Um, I just might point out to you that Jesus Christ didn't need to have faith since he was the way, the truth, and the life. But secondly, in the same verse, it says, works of the law, the law did not do any works. You understand? It's the works that is described or necessitated by the law, right? Just like faith isn't something Christ has exercised in himself, it's what Christ necessitates and follows from him, Amen. right? It's what he describes. And so the fact that there is Christ now, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Jesus, who's done this stuff for us, like dying on the cross and raising from the dead, it's the faith necessitated by him. Okay, moving on, Galatians 2.16, think about that for a while. But he says in verse 17, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. And he goes on to describe how we're not justified by the works of the law or by our flesh. Okay. And so the conclusion of Galatians, we're just summarizing the whole book based on this key verse here in Galatians 3, you can read it for yourself, is that justification, getting blessed by God, is not by circumcision, 
Okay, we'll put circumcision up here. It's not by circumcision. Paul will say that many times throughout the book. It's not by circumcision. All right? It's not by the law. He just said that in Galatians 2, verse 16. And it's not by Israel either. You don't have to be a Jew to get blessed from God. Right? Another way to describe this is the circumcision speaks about what you do in your flesh. We talked last week about that covenant of circumcision teaching us, and teaching Abraham, it should have, to have no confidence in your flesh. When you cut part of your flesh off, it's because you don't have confidence in it. That's the idea. And so, flesh, circumcision, law is works. That the works of the law is what the verse said. And if you're Israel, what makes you Israel? The covenants. And so, it's not according to God's covenants, works, or your flesh. You get blessed by God. You get justified by God. What is it by? Well, we said the faith of Jesus Christ. And so, what it is by is, we'll put this over here in blue, <clears throat> the promise of the Spirit. We'll put the Spirit here. In fact, we're drawing this different. So, it's more clear here. The Spirit, right? He's going to talk about this in Galatians. A lot about the Spirit talking there. Because it's not flesh. It's Spirit. How do we get blessed and justified by God? It's not law and works. What is it? Hey. And it's not being Israel. It's not a covenant. What is it? Well, it's Jesus Christ. And that is different. Jesus Christ is a person. A covenant is a contract. Yeah, the contract may require Christ, but Christ is a person and a body. You're a part of his body, not a part of this contract. So you have spirit, faith, in Christ. And this is Galatians. Here it is. How are we blessed by God? Is it circumcision or law or Israel, covenant, works, flesh? No, it's by the spirit and through faith. In Jesus Christ, this has to do with it being a promise, Amen. meaning God does that. He communicates the Gospels that you believe. He is Christ. God's Christ. Jesus Christ is God. And the Holy Spirit also is God. So this is something God performs here, as opposed to this, which is what people perform. Yeah. you got to maintain your position of covenant. You either are a Jew or you're not. You have to do the works of the law, and it's your flesh. So this is you doing something, this is God doing something, Amen. right? And Paul's point is, you don't get blessed this way, you get blessed that way. What's interesting here is that you can find in the Bible where God promises blessing this way. We talked about the covenants last week. He told Abraham, circumcise your flesh, and if you don't, you're cut off. Which would seem to indicate that if you get circumcised, you get a blessing. Yes. He gave special privileges and blessings to Israel. What advantage hath the Jew, Paul asks. He says, much every way. There's a blessing to being Israel, right? In the works of the law, Jews even today take it as a privilege to do the God's law. You might say, well, doing the law of God is something of a hindrance to our trusting God's grace. And it is, because the law commands you to do, and everyone fails to keep the law perfectly. So we have to trust God's grace. But the Jews today say doing the law is a privilege and a blessing, and by keeping it, we get blessed by God. And so, how do we get blessed is what Galatians teaches. Is it by our flesh, our law-keeping, and being in God's covenants, or is it by God's Spirit through faith in what Christ did? Okay. Look at Galatians 3, verse 14. Galatians 3, 14. Galatians 3, 6 through 14, rather. Paul's beginning this argument in Galatians about how we get blessed, how we get uh, justified by God. Which is 3, verse 6. He raises the question, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Have you began in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Right? He's just raising the, the questions here. Have you suffered so many things in vain for Christ and faith and the Spirit that you're going back to what God was doing? In Galatians 3, verse 6, he says, He, even as Abraham, believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is Genesis 15, 7 where God told Abraham, I'd give you a seed like the stars in the sky. And Abraham believed, and it says in Genesis 15, 7, that God counted his faith for righteousness. Paul quotes it. Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Faith. Right? So what's he saying? You're not a child of Abraham just because you're of Israel, doing works of the law, and are circumcised. He'll say this later. Faith is the requirement. And that would seem then to be a way that you could be justified if you're not Israel. If you're not keeping the law is by faith. Verse 7, <clears throat> Know ye therefore that they which are the faith are the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, 
not through their works, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. We just read that before Genesis 12. God promised to Abraham all the families of the earth will be blessed through him. Paul is explaining the blessing there that all families get is that Abraham believed God, and apparently Paul's teaching now, if you believe what Christ has done, you believe this gospel, you can get justified. Okay. And so he says in verse 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are in, written in the book of the law to do them. It's according to the law. If you don't do everything the law says, you're cursed. God will punish you. Right? The law doesn't work to save you. It doesn't work to help you. It tells you what you must do that's right. And when you fail, which everyone does, it condemns you. So we're all condemned. No flesh can be justified by the law. Verse 11 even says that. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for even the Old Testament says, the just shall live by faith. Even the Old Testament, when they broke the law, they had to plead to God for mercy, offer sacrifices, then plead, God, please forgive me. We have the knowledge in this dispensation of grace, the gospel of grace, that Christ has died to offer forgiveness freely to all, so that we know how we get forgiven. The Old Testament, people would plead for forgiveness, and now the gospel in the scripture says you get forgiveness. Christ has already forgiven you. Trust his finished work, and you'll be forgiven of all your sins. Colossians 2.13. And so Galatians chapter 3, verse 12. The law is not of faith. If you're trying to keep the law to get the blessed from God and get justified by God, it is not of faith. Because the law says the man that does them shall live in them, What's faith say? The man that believes what God does gets blessed. Amen. So he says, The man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Now notice the, 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 the key verse in verse 14. This is the central verse of this chapter. It's arguably the central verse of the whole book. The book talks about how we're blessed and justified by God. And this verse says that the blessing of Abraham because of what Christ did, becoming a curse for us, he died on the cross as the law demanded, sinners do, to pay for our sins. That the blessing of Abraham, what's the blessing of Abraham? He got justified by believing that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's the verse. That because of what Christ did, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, which is to say, everybody. Not just Jews anymore, Gentiles also. Doesn't that mean all the families of the earth can be blessed? Yes. But how's Paul saying you're blessed? Through Jesus Christ, you receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. Right? I don't say do anything to get the Spirit. You trust Christ's finished work. Ephesians 1.13 says, You hear the gospel of your salvation, and after which you are trusted, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. You trust what he's done. He gives you a spirit. That's a blessing. That's justification. That's salvation. Right? That's you're in Christ. You weren't circumcised. You didn't do the law. You're not Israel. You see the argument Paul's making? And so Galatians 3, 14, that's the verse you highlight right there. That's the central doctrine that he's trying to communicate. Now, I, I'm doing, uh, teaching all this to us because we're going to get to Galatians 3, 29, where he says, you're Abraham's seed. He'll say, does that make us Israel? Why does that make you something over here if you get blessed for over here? You see the argument in Galatians? This is how you get justified, not this. Well, that verse, Galatians 9, that, that makes us Israel, puts us out of the covenants. Well, you're, going, you're crossing the line. You're going back to how Paul's saying, no, you're not justified that way. That's the whole point of the book, right? To say that now we're in Israel's covenants, and now we got to do those works, and now we got to maintain the covenant, and now we got, are the circumcision in the flesh, is to deny what Paul's actually saying in Galatians. Right? We talked last week, Paul in Philippians 3 says, we are the circumcision. And people who make this case say, oh, there it is. But he says with the circumcision, because we have no confidence in the flesh. So he's not saying because you're actually circumcised. Colossians 2 says you're circumcised in Christ. Like, it's the operation of God. It's not what you did at all. You're separated from your flesh, right? We have no confidence in the flesh. So to talk about actual circumcision or your actual flesh is to deny how God blesses people today. 
okay, or to talk about the works of the law that you must do to get a blessing. The law is holy, just, and good. The law is righteous. Right? We should do good works. But to say we have to do these good works to get blessed by God is to reject what God's freely given to you today. Okay. And so Galatians chapter 3 communicates this. Now, let's talk a little bit here about the promises. The promises given to Abraham. <clears throat> okay. A promise received is what someone else does, right? When someone gives you a promise, you're not doing anything. It's what they do. Nine and a half years ago, I made a promise to my wife. I would love her for the rest of my life. Does she have to do anything? Nope. Right? This last week, I also made a promise to the telephone company. I will pay them some of my riches if they give me phone service. Right? There's a condition to that one. <laughs> I did not marry the phone company. I made a promise to them. Well, you just said you made a promise to your wife to love her the rest of your life. Why didn't you make the same promise to the phone company? Right? And this is like elementary, right? Yes, of course. People make different promises. They enter into different agreements. Yes. Then why do people come to the Bible and think every time the word promise shows up, it's the same one? Right? We're heirs according to the promise. That's got to be Israel's covenants. How do you know that exactly? Is that was the promise given to Abraham? Galatians 3 is talking about the promise of the Spirit and righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ, which Abraham didn't know about that, right? We talked last week. That's why I set up that lesson last week about how you can learn lessons from the covenants without participating in the actual promises that God gave those people. He promised Abraham a land. You have no claim to any land on this planet, okay? But you can learn that God justifies by faith, because when Abraham believed that God would give him the land, he never saw ownership of it a day in his life. But when he believed God, he counted to him for righteousness. What do we learn from reading about that covenant? God can justify according to faith. We're not participants in that contract with God and Abraham, so we don't have any claim of the land. Right? You don't have to provide me phone service. <laughs> it's like this is a different contract, different agreement. But you can learn something. Right? How much is he paying? What's his agreement? He's getting a better deal. You know, you can learn a lot of things. So not every promise is the same. You got to know which one the scripture is talking about in the place you're reading. The lessons we learn from the covenants are different from their details. Abraham was promised a land. He was promised a multiplied seed. Like he is said that many nations will come from you, Abraham. Remember he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And that name change is speaking about in the meaning of the name that he'll be a father of many nations. Can you claim that? I'm a father now. I have a son, so I'm going to be a father of many nations. I can't claim that. Right? He didn't make that contract with me, that promise with me. But I can learn from Abraham's covenant with God. Wow, God can do amazing things. And God can apparently make nations come out of a dead womb. You know, Sarah, right? God can do things. And he can justify by faith. Abraham, and this is not just a lesson that Paul teaches us, folks. Paul takes these lessons out from Jewish teaching from his heritage, like all scripture is profitable, right? Abraham is the classic example of faith in Israel. Yeah. They teach Abraham, Abraham faith. That's the teaching. So when he brings Abraham up, it's like a Jew that has ears is going to go, oh, he's talking about faith. Like that's the lesson you learn from Abraham. There's also covenants, but there's that lesson. Sarah, Paul communicates, the lesson you learn from her is grace, by the way. So Abraham, faith, Sarah, grace. You say, why is Sarah grace? Because Abraham, as old as he was, could still perform, okay, like literally. Sarah could not. Sarah had a barrenness, right? Could not have children. How did she have a son? God helped her, right? That's called grace. God did something she couldn't do. That's grace. So Abraham, epitome of faith, because God told him he'd do something, he believed it. Sarah, grace. She couldn't do it, God helped her. So you have faith in grace as a mother and father, what do you think faith and grace are going to produce? Right? This is what Paul's going to communicate. They produce a son, literally, in the Old Testament, but that son is called the child of promise. Why? It's the promise God gave to Abraham that by his grace through Sarah, right, there's this child of promise produced. And Paul draws on these lessons and says, don't you know, Abraham teaches faith, Sarah's teaching grace, and their child is a promise. If it's a promise, what is it not of? What you do. Right? This is how Paul brings us up. People read Galatians, they say, Paul is talking about Israel everywhere. That must mean we're Israel. No, he's using the lessons you learn. Yeah. 
and communicating his gospel. These, the Galatians were trying to walk under the law. And he's saying that's not how God wants us to walk today. He wants us to walk in Christ under his grace. Walking under the law to receive things from God is a denial of what Christ has done for you. If you love Jesus Christ and you trust Jesus Christ, then walk in what he's done for you, how he's made you. He's made you a new creature. He has changed you. Learn about that. That's different than saying, what do I do? Give me the rules. Right? That's not how God blesses today. This is how God blesses today. Amen. Okay. So in Galatians chapter 3 then, we learn about these promises, these lessons. Jacob, Abraham was a father of Israel. Isaac's a father of Israel. Jacob's a father. What does Jacob teach? Paul brings up Jacob in Romans 9, remember? When he talks about God's election. Everyone's Calvinist bells are going off election. Oh, no, no, election, we're Calvinist. It's a biblical teaching of election. It's not what Calvin taught, okay? It means choice or choosing. And when God promised Isaac would have a seed, his wife, also barren, by the way, had to have children. God had to intervene there as well, right? And she had twins. Praise be to God, glorious day, twins, right? The twins, which one gets the promise? This is the question, right? Well, Jacob eventually gets it. And Romans 9 explains that even go back in Genesis and read it, God chose who he would give the promise to before they were born. And Romans 9 says he did that. Why didn't he? You know, Abraham knew nothing about his covenant. He was 100 years old. Right? So he was born without knowledge of any sort of covenant promise God will give him. He lived most of his life. I mean, he's retiring, you know. And no knowledge of the covenant promise. Then finally, 100 years old, he gets something. Jacob, not yet born, has no knowledge of sin, doesn't know anything, hasn't done anything, hasn't sinned. But he's conceived, and God says, that one. The younger is going to serve the elder. Right? Remember that? In Romans 9, Paul explains, he did that to teach us that his choosing is according to his purpose. It's not according to their works. That's important with Jacob, because Jacob lied to his father. Remember that? Jacob lied to his father in order to get an inheritance. And God says, that's not why I gave it to him. I gave it to him because I chose him before he was born. Right? That's really helpful. In fact, that's the reason, among other reasons, why Islam today denies Israel as God's people. Because yeah. their father Jacob lied to their father. Yeah. Right? Isaac had his own problems. But the teaching of the Bible is, God didn't choose Jacob because of what he did wrong. He chose him according to his purpose before he was born, having not yet sinned. Okay, so you learn these lessons. These are great lessons to learn from these Old Testament characters. You learn a lot of other lessons from other Old Testament characters. I bring up these three because we're talking about the fathers of Israel this morning. Okay. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promises were given to those fathers were the land, seed, and blessing. All three of those fathers had that promise. God repeated it. Do you, have you read Genesis? We studied through it verse by verse. He gave Abraham the promise multiple times. And he gave Isaac the promise, the same one he gave to Abraham. And then he gave Jacob a reiteration of the promise to, to Isaac. So all three fathers were given this promise of a mighty nation and a blessing to the world, to all the families of the world in this sort of business. And so in Romans 14, Romans 4.13, turn there real quick. Stay in Galatians 3, we'll come back. Romans 4.13, Paul explains what this promise was to Abraham. Not all promises are the same. The promise that he should be, in Romans 4.13, it's talking about Abraham. The promise given to Abraham that he should be the heir of the world. You see that? What does that mean? Right? Remember, he promised the world to him. Right? It's like the subject of love letters that never come true. You know? I love you so much, I'll give you the world. It's like, you, you don't even have the power. You know? It's like, romantic, but, you know, silly. God promised Abraham the world. He'd be a nation above the nations. The nation of Israel from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would reign over the entire world. Christ as king, of course. Right? The promise to Abraham was the heir of the world. Does he promise you and I that? No. Does he promise the body of Christ that? No. He doesn't promise you individually that, for sure. But the promise here was defined as the heir of the world. Later, Paul's going to talk about the promise that he made to you of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's different than heir of the world. Right? I mean, eternal life's great. So, I mean, don't say you're missing out. But it's like, heir of the world, eternal life, different. Okay? Promises are different. 
The promises in Galatians 3 are defined by the righteousness of God by faith, the Holy Spirit, <coughs> Jesus Christ, not as heir of the world. I mentioned before that there are three fathers of Israel, and there are three fathers of Israel for good reasons, okay, which we will uh, enumerate now quite literally. Three fathers of Israel. Why are the three fathers? You ever asked this question? They never thought about it. The Sunday school. Well, you should consider it. Why are the three fathers? God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and though the promises had in similarity a land, a mighty nation, seed, and blessing to the world, they did have slight differences to them. In fact, there are some things that some had and some did not, because God made promises plural to them, and you have to go back and study those out. And, uh, and so we, we, we will do that. But part of the reasons why God made three fathers to this one nation, it doesn't require three fathers, by the way, just to think about that through. Right? I'm not talking about the founding fathers of America. That's a different type of thing. Those are people that are maybe unrelated to you entirely. We're talking here in Israel about genealogical fathering of the people that would be the nation of Israel, right? Jews, Hebrews, um, Israelites. Sarah had one child. <clears throat> you know this, right? <clears throat> she had one and only one, then she died. Not right after, but eventually she did. Abraham, however, had more than one. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously Ishmael, which he had with Hagar before Sarah's Isaac. But he also had others, yeah. right? In Genesis 25, if you remember, let me say, I don't remember Genesis 25. <laughs> you ever heard of Shua? No? Midian? Joshkan, Ishbak, Zimran? No? Not ringing a bell? Other sons of Abraham. Then after Sarah died, is the context, uh, Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, and Jokshan, and Midian, and Median, and Ishbak, and Shua. And it goes on to list their genealogies. There's a lot of people coming from Abraham. There's Ishmael, and he had the Ishmaelites and everyone from him. Then there's Isaac, and of course we know who came from him, Jacob and those guys, right? And then there's these folks, the Midianites. You ever heard of the Midianites? Yes. Abrahamic. Who knew? Well, the Bible did. You should have, right? The Midianites came from Abraham. So the Midianites had the same father as Israel. But Abraham wasn't the sole father of the nation of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob could have claimed to the closest descent because he had 12 sons, and those 12 sons defined the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Jacob's name was changed quite literally to Israel. God said, your name will be Israel. So Jacob's name was changed to Israel. But all three of these men, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, are called the fathers of Israel because that's where they came from, and that's where the promises began with Abraham, right? So I bring this up because there's a reason why there's three promises, and it's not just an accident of history. God could have started the whole promise situation with Jacob, right? I mean, he's going to have 12 sons. He could have said, I'm going to make you a mighty nation. You're going to have 12 sons, and that'd be it. So the first generation, he's going, yeah, that's a lot of kids. That might, might be what you expect. If God told you you'd be a mighty nation, you're going, all right, got to get busy. Jacob had 12 sons, right? That's not what happened. Abraham, big old glorious promise. How many sons did, did he have through Sarah? One. Right? How many children are promised from Abraham after having so many? Why is only one child a promise? God said, I'd make you a mighty nation. It requires more than two people, you know. Why only one? Because God is communicating, as we'll see in Galatians, this doctrine of a single seed from Abraham. A single seed, just one. If there's more than one, it's going to ruin what God wants you to learn, which we now know, according to the mystery. Okay. It's also going to ruin this idea of many nations. If Jacob was the first one to promise, right? and his 12 sons made up the singular nation of Israel, there wouldn't be many nations from Jacob, would there? There'd be one nation. So you needed at least a second father to have many nations. I mean, you had Jacob as Israel, then you had another guy. But you know, then why couldn't Isaac be the guy? Because he had Jacob and Esau. So Esau had the Edomites, and Jacob had the Israelites, and there you go, many nations, you know. There's three. It's interesting. Abram had more. Romans chapter 4, verse 1, we know about Hagar and Ishmael. And Paul brings this up in Romans 4, and he says, What did Abraham, our father, learn according to the flesh? Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh, hath found? What did he learn? Verse 2 gives you the answer. I love it when God makes Bible study easy. 
If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. To him that worketh not, but believes on God, on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. You learn that Abraham learned when he had Ishmael. He thought, well, God gave me a promise to have a son. It'd be through me, and my wife's barren, so maybe I'll find another woman. And him and Sarah agreed on this, right? And they did that. They thought, well, we're going to trust God, and we'll, well, I guess this other woman here. And then God responded, nope, that's not it. Whoops. What did you learn? <laughs> you got another kid to take care of, right? What you learn, that it's not of your flesh, right? It's going to be a grace, and what did he mean by that? It's not of her. She can have babies. Yeah, isn't that how it works? Well, it's not of the flesh he wants to communicate. He wants to communicate it's of grace. She can't have babies. So I'm going to have it through her to show you it's of grace. That I'm going to do it, not you. You see, that's the lesson he wants to communicate. So Abraham was ruining the lesson. Right? Now, God knew what would happen, but I mean, you see what I'm saying? He learned something in the flesh. And we, we learned that from Ishmael and Hagar. In Genesis 25, we already saw the many sons he had. There are three fathers of Israel. And did you know... You would if you think about it, that zero fathers were under the law of Moses, right? Moses was an Israelite, descendant from Jacob. The law was given to Moses. Do I have to draw it out? No? You're good? We can draw time? Okay, you can think this far. There's the timeline. Here's Mount Sinai where the law was given, right? There's Moses. And then there's fathers. There's Abraham, and he had Isaac, and he had Jacob. Later, Moses. None of the fathers were under the law of Moses. Well, that's important because Abraham's talking about faith. Isaac's a picture of, you know, the child of promise and Jacob's teaching election. But none of them are under the law of Moses. Are you under the law of Moses? Romans 6, 14 says you're not under the law, you're under grace. And some Jews says, well, what's the precedent for that? God's law is perfect, and it is. But where in the Bible do you find this? Uh, Genesis 1 through Exodus 14. Right? Not under the law. Zero fathers under the law of Moses. Now, did you know that also one father was only one could be called Israel? Abraham was not an Israelite. Isaac wasn't an Israelite. They're the fathers of Israel. How can they not be an Israelite? Because they had sons. He was called Israel. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And his sons then, the 12 sons, became the 12 tribes of Israel, of Jacob. He wasn't Israelite. He wasn't Israelite. Only Jacob could be called Israel. That's interesting. So if Abraham's our father, are we Israel? No, not in any way. Even if you did take part in Abraham's covenant promises, you couldn't call yourself Israel unless you're a son of Jacob. And nowhere, nowhere in all of Paul's epistles does he ever talk about Jacob as your father. He will talk about you as Isaac, our children of promise. But never does he relate you to Jacob. Okay. The closest that comes is Romans chapter 9. And he's not talking about you, but Israel. Where he says Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Down in verse oh, 7. Not all of Israel, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall I seed be called. He's explaining about Israel and saying, just because you're of Abraham doesn't mean you're Israel, doesn't mean you have the covenant, you have to be of Isaac, right? And then he says in verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise. You know what he's talking about, right? That's the lesson we just learned. Hagar, Ishmael's child of flesh, but Isaac's the child of promise. This is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only Sarah and Isaac, not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived, even by our father Isaac, this is Jacob now. The children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. That's the lesson we ought to learn. Not by works, but of him that calls. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. Jacob have I loved. But he's not talking about him being your father. He's just talking about how Israel comes from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And God chooses someone to get that promise. Right? So only one father could be called Israel. Did you know only two fathers were circumcised when they received the promise? None of them are under the law. Only one could be called Israel. Only two were circumcised. Let's get another color here. 
these guys were circumcised when they received the promise from God. So, so what, if they're circumcised or not? Well, circumcised was a covenant God made that if you're circumcised, you get my blessings, and if you're not, you don't. These guys were circumcised, and then God reiterated the promise that he gave to Abraham. You can make the argument then, if they were circumcised when they got the promise, that only the circumcision get the promise, which would have been true. You following along still? Okay. How many fathers does that leave? One that was not under the law, not Israel, and not circumcised when he got the promise. Oh, right. Paul's lesson in Galatians is you're not Israel, you're not under the law, you're not circumcised. That's how you get blessed. Only one father can explain that. Right? That's why there's three. You need three to teach all those lessons. That's why he doesn't bring up Jacob in the Galatians, and why he only brings up Isaac to teach about the promised son, because he was the child of promise that God gave to Abraham. Right? He says, as Isaac, so were you, the child of promise. He is, Isaac's not your father. He doesn't say that. He says, you're Abraham's seed, which means you are children of promise. Okay? So isn't that interesting? Abraham then had a unique blessing. Even though the land, seed, and blessing to the nation of Israel were reiterated through all three of these men, Abraham was in a unique position because he was the only one that received the promise before circumcision. You may say, well, he was circumcised. Yes, but read Romans 4. Did he receive the promise initially while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? The answer is uncircumcised. And that's not by an accident. That's on purpose. So that the uncircumcision, in fact, let's read Romans 4. Romans 4. <clears throat> How was the blessing reckoned to Abraham? Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Blessed is the man that does not look at someone's works, but God blesses them anyway. Blessed is the man that God says, I'll do something for you just by faith, not by works. Blessed is that man in verse 8. Verse 9, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? I mean, maybe this is just a circumcision thing. And he says in verse 10, how was it reckoned to Abraham? When he was in circumcision or uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. He received the sign of circumcision, that is later, as a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he already had, which he had yet being uncircumcised. That he might be the father. Listen to this. He received it in uncircumcision. That he might be the father of of all them that believe, not being circumcised, not under the law, without Israel's covenant promises. Right? Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them too. Are you Israel? Are you under the law? Are you circumcised? Is Abraham your father? By faith, yes. By flesh, no. But by faith, yes. Yeah, because he believed and God blessed him and he was counted righteous by faith. What God told him is he'd have a land. He didn't tell you that. He told you Christ died for your sins. Amen. But you believe, and he blesses you with righteousness. <clears throat> so in verse 12, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> he's the father of the circumcision. Oh, I forgot that very first important word. He says he's the father of all them that believe in verse 11. <clears throat> and then verse 12, and the father of circumcision. So he's the father of the uncircumcised who believe, and the father of the circumcision, because I'll draw the line here. He was circumcised at a point in time, right? At the point in time in his life, he was circumcised. Before then, he's the father of the uncircumcision, right? And then when he was circumcised, he becomes the father of the circumcision, right? To them who are not of the circumcision only. Now, this is where people get confused. What's he saying here? Is he including Gentiles into the circumcision covenant? No, he's saying that it doesn't, it takes more than circumcision to get you the promise. How do you know that? He says, he's the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. Faith, not works of the law. Faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. <clears throat> what identifies the true circumcision? The people who get the promise or the blessing who are circumcised. How do you identify those people? Abraham had many sons. All of them were circumcised. One was a child of promise. Isaac had sons, plural. 
Both of them were circumcised. That was the covenant God gave them. One, a child of promise. There are more circumcision than there are those who get the promise. Isn't that what Paul teaches? That's what the Old Testament teaches, right? But you see, he's the father of both groups. In verse 11, the father of, of the uncircumcision and the father of the true circumcision, not just of the flesh, but who walk after the faith of Abraham. Because you have to have faith. You have to believe to be part of the promise. You can't just be circumcised and you're in. And isn't that what Jesus taught too? You say you're Israel? Follow me. Why do we have to follow you? We're circumcised. He goes, uh, because without faith, you're not getting in the kingdom. Right? Without following me, he says, you're not getting in. So you see the two groups here, uncircumcised and circumcised. Paul in Galatians 2 goes to Peter and says, Jesus Christ gave me the gospel of the uncircumcision as he gave you the gospel of the circumcision. Peter goes to the circumcised, Paul goes to the uncircumcised. You see how this all comports with the Old Testament? The mystery isn't revealed back there, but it, man, it teaches a lot to us back here, doesn't it? Okay. Abraham had a unique blessing. If Abraham were called Israel... If Abraham's name was changed to Israel, so he was the singular father here, <clears throat> there couldn't be many nations. We covered that before. If Isaac were called Israel, you say, well, why do you need three? Because Isaac, maybe. Maybe he can be called Israel. Well, then Israel would be the only recipient of the promise. Okay, because you have Jacob there. And Jacob had a unique promise because Jacob was never said to be the father of many nations. You read Genesis chapter 35. When God promised Jacob the land, seed, and blessing. In Genesis chapter 35, verse 10, he promised, he changed the promise a little bit. He didn't like change it in the sense of not coming true. It just was not the same thing he gave to Abraham. He says, God said unto him, unto Jacob, thy name is Jacob. Thy name uh, shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I will, I am God almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. And look what he says. A nation shall be of thee. A nation and a company of nations, like a nation made up of a company, like 12 guys. There's 12 tribes. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give it to thee and thy seed forever. So you see the difference there? He didn't tell Abraham a nation. He said, you'd be the father of many nations. All the families will be blessed through you. To Jacob, he's like, you're, gonna, you're Israel, and you're going to have a nation. And this nation's going to be the blessing of the world. But it's still the Israel covenant. But it's slightly different there. It's like, you're it. They're, you're the end of the father line. The nation's up. Right? You need to have three fathers. So we can learn lessons according to the mystery, so that Israel has their covenant promises, so that there's a singular seed from Abraham. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, or Galatians chapter 3, rather. Finish this out, Galatians 3. I haven't yet got to verse 29. People raise that verse, they go, that's hard, I don't get it. The assumption is, you've read the rest of your Bible before Galatians chapter 3, that you know what he's talking about when he talks about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I mean, this is old news, right? So when he says things like this, you have to know the context, biblically speaking, and also in, in the chapter and in the book. In Galatians 3, we, we ended in verse 14, right? In verse 14, or 15, it says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Everyone knows this, whether you're Jew or not, Gentile or not. Though it be but a man's covenant, a contract between two men, not between God and man, which would seem to be more significant. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or added thereto. If you write a contract out, you cannot change it. Unless it's agreed upon. You know, it's like you write a contract out, that's it. Right? You can't disannul it or add it. That's just between men. If God promises, you think he's going to nullify it or change it? Well, I, I said that, but I, I'm going to change it. Well, he's God, I guess. He can do what he wants. Now, that's called sin, right? And that's what he's saying here. He's saying even men don't do that. Why do you think God would do that? God doesn't change his covenants. He says in verse 16, now, you would think that would be a case against Paul. You say, well, Paul, if he doesn't change his covenants, then what are you saying that he can justify without Israel? Right? Look at verse 16. Paul's going to use these lessons we've learned from the Old Testament to show that he hasn't changed the covenants. He's just doing something different now. God's not limited. He can enter as many covenants or not covenants as he wants. He's going to keep his covenant to Israel. But he doesn't have one with you. 
you're a new creature. Galatians 3 and verse 16. Now he's going to talk about this covenant to Abraham. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. This, we all know this, right? He saith not. Now he's pulling out the contract, going, look at the contract. The words don't say. He says, he saith not, and to seeds as many. Now we don't even use the word that way when you and I talk. We, we, the word seed in English is singular and plural, right? I have a bag of seed, and look, I found a seed on the ground. You know, we use the same word, so it's hard to interpret that way. But Paul's making clearly the case here that the promise to Abraham was not of many people, right? When he told Abraham you'd have a son, right, you'd have a seed, your seed would get the promise, he's talking about one of them. He didn't say your seeds would get the promise, meaning that every son you get will get the promise, right? We just studied that, right? you got to be of Abraham, but not everyone of Abraham gets the promise, just one child. Right? So that's the point he's making. There's one. He says in verse uh, 16, He saith, Not into seeds as of many, but as of one, into thy seed, which is Christ. All right. Now, this is interesting, because Paul's making the case here for a singular seed. And for this reason, many Christians say, well, you see, God's changed what he was doing. He promised Abraham a, a nation of many people, but that's, that's not what's going on now. Right? He, he changed that to mean just Jesus Christ. They say the covenants given to Abraham were fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the sense that when he said a multiplied nation, he means the church, which has many people in it. Now, we're not a nation. We're a body. A nation has laws and land and everything. We're a, 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 a spiritual organism, a body of Christ. People change it that way. Okay? But that's not what Paul is communicating here. The Old Testament very clearly promises Abraham a multiplied seed. Look up the word multiply in your concordance. You'll find it many times. I listed some verses down here where he says to Abraham, I will multiply your seed. Right? That's not singular. That's like many. Right? So what, where's Paul getting this? He saith not into seeds. What's he talking about? He's talking about how many fathers was this promise made that you'd have a, a son a singular son. One. There are three fathers to Israel, but there's just one that was promised a singular seed. Jacob has twins through barren Rebekah. Jacob has 12 sons, right? How many does Abraham have through Sarah? One, right? He's the only child of promise. Rebekah had twins, like I said. Jacob had 12 sons. Abraham had one. He's the only father that was given a promise of a singular seed. In Matthew 1, verse 1, it says, the very beginning of the New Testament, there, portion of your Bible, it says, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Yes. Right? Jesus is the one seed that was promised from Abraham. You'll have one. Without Abraham, you missed that, right? Jacob had 12. Isaac had twins. Which one is it? It's a big debate. Right? Abraham had one through Sarah. All right? Galatians 3, verse 16, then, it's not to seed as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Amen. The promised singular seed, by the way, the, the promised seed of Abraham, Abraham's promised singular seed is who? Is it you? It's Christ. That's what Paul says. Now, the troubled verse says, you be Christ, you are Abraham's seed. You're only Abraham's seed because you are Christ's. Amen. You are in him. Right? Remember the word communion that we study so often? What's the word mean? Common union. We're all united in what? The body of Christ. There's one body, one Lord, one faith, and one seed, which is Christ, that is promised through Abraham. Isaac can't save anybody. Right? How is he going to be a blessing to the world? When God says, I'll bless the world through Abraham, you know he's talking about Jesus, right? I mean, even the Jews knew they were talking about the Messiah and the Christ. So Galatians 3, verse 16, he says that. Verse 17, And this I say, the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, just make the promise not effect. He's saying that even though I promised Abraham a seed that would be a blessing to the world, and then later I add the law, which has conditions all over it. This cannot cancel this. Why? Because he made the promise first. 
right? I mean, it, even you and I know this. It's like, you might have had that thought before. It's like, well, if he promised Abraham, why is he adding conditions? I mean, that's just like a raw deal. But you got to know, God's always trying to teach us stuff, right? And like the, the things he's trying to teach us are not things we make up. They're things the scripture tells us, okay? But he's trying to communicate faith and grace and everything else. And the law tries to communicate. What does the law teach us? Don't steal on your father. Yeah, it teaches those things. That's what the law says. But the law lesson that we learn, because we're not under the law, the law lesson is there's none righteous. None can be justified by the law, Romans 3.21. That's what the law is supposed to teach you. If you haven't learned a lesson that I can't keep the law and I need Christ to save me, you haven't learned a lesson of the law. You're just trying to do it and failing constantly. The lesson God wants you to know is that this is holy, righteous, and good. Here's the righteous standard, and nobody can reach it. That's why you need my mercy. You need my grace. Paul will say in Galatians 3, the law is supposed to bring us to Christ. It's supposed to bring us to a knowledge of Jesus Christ because we need a Savior. Okay. And so in Galatians chapter 3, in verse 17, the law cannot nullify the promise. The promise then overrides that, doesn't it? Even if Israel, which they did, broke the law entirely, which they did, does that mean God gives up on his promise? No. He promised they'd be a nation that would bless the world. Which is why we so adamantly stand upon as dispensationalists that, yes, there's the body of Christ in the church, but God will also bless the world through saved Israel because that's what he promised without condition. It's not conditioned on their keeping the law or crucifying their Messiah. He promised it. They have to come back, and he's got to fulfill it right? by his own words. In Galatians 3, in verse 18, if the inheritance... Now, what was Abraham promised as an inheritance? The world, right? Remember that? The promise is the heir of the world, right? If the inheritance be of the law, if they get the world only if they keep the law, it's not a promise anymore, right? So if they're only Israel, like the Israel of God and the kingdom, if they keep the promise, it's not, the, uh, not a promise anymore. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Well, then the question raises, why then serve the law? It was added because of transgressions. What does that mean? Like, people are sinning, we got to put a stop to that. No, not, no, that's not why. I mean, the law doesn't stop sin. The law makes sin abound because it makes more rules that you could possibly break. Yes. Some of you may sympathize with that. It's like, more rules, more rules you can break, more criminals. But Galatians 3.19, why serve the law then? I mean, if, if, if you don't get the blessing, the inheritance because of the law, but by promise, then why you serve the law? It was added because of the transgressions. you got to do what God says, number one. But number two, the lesson is that you can't do it. It was supposed to communicate the knowledge of sin. Till the seed should come. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. The law is over here. And he said the law's function was to communicate transgressions, like to teach you that you have sin, until the seed come, right? Oh, wait a minute. I thought the seed had already come over here. See what's going on? Well, that, that, the seed that was promised to Abraham was Christ. Amen. That was the promised seed. That makes a child born from a barren woman a little more significant, right? Because, yeah, it was Isaac, but he was no savior. But there was a person born of a virgin. Like, she couldn't have the baby either. And God intervened. And that was the Messiah. That ring a bell? So it's like the whole Virgin Mary thing. That wasn't like the new, new thing happening. It's like back in the Old Testament, God helped women conceive as well. Different than Mary in that she was a virgin, but nonetheless. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 20... He says, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. There's one seed, that seed was Christ. Is the law then in verse 21, I might add here before I move on to verse 21, that when he says in, in, in verse uh, 16 that it's not too many seeds, it's of one seed, okay? The one seed here is what, as I mentioned before, is ex excludes the law and the circumcision. The fact that it's Abraham, okay? If he gave that promise to Isaac or Jacob, it would include circumcision of the law. That he gave it to Abraham excludes that. Amen. So when Jesus Christ comes, Jesus Christ is the promised seed who fulfills the law, who is perfect in spirit, okay, who, who is uh, fulfilling God's uh, promises to Israel. He can then offer without circumcision. Moving on to verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law which could have given life, Righteousness should have been by the law. The law is holy, righteous, and good. But the scripture had concluded all under sin. That's what the law teaches. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. 
That, that's, the, that's what God wanted to do. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. This part is much easier to understand. Before faith came, the faith that's necessitated by Christ, believing in him, there was the law. Right? And so you have uh, in verse 24, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith, not by works. After faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. After you graduate school, you don't go back. Why would you, right? You say, to learn more. Well, you can learn more, sure, but it's like you learned a lesson, you're done, right? You don't go back to first grade and do your addition and subtraction, learn how to write, right? You've already learned it. That's his point. If you learned a lesson of the law, you're all sinners, you need the promise given to Abraham, and Christ fulfills the promise, and you can be justified by faith, you're justified by faith, is what Paul is communicating. And so, how are we, in verse 26, made children of God then? After that faith has come, we're no longer a schoolmaster, you are all the children of God. Well, I thought the children of God were the children of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We've already proved that the promise given to Abraham of the singular seed means you can be children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? If you believe in the son of Abraham, the promised child, right? Not, not disrespecting what he did on the cross to save you. Isaac's not a savior. He is, right? Then you are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 28 through 29, this is the context here. This is what you are in verse 27. As many of you have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. He teaches in 1 Corinthians and Romans 6. You're baptized into Christ by the Spirit, right? You're baptized into Him by faith. Romans, uh, or Galatians 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Well, the circumcision separates Jew and Gentile. Doesn't it? Yeah, you're not part of that. That's not it. Abraham was uncircumcised. There's no difference there. Okay. He's the father of faith to those that are uncircumcised and to those that are circumcised. He says, then, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. Right. You're not inheriting the world, folks. You don't take part in the land, seed, and blessing that it was promised to Abraham. Abraham and the promise given to Abraham in Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 through 11 is the righteousness by faith. And you get that blessing because you are Christ's, not because you're Israel. Right? That's what he says, the very first few words there. So when someone brings this up or you read this, you know, this is difficult. Why am I Abraham's seed? Does that make me Israel? None of those fathers were Israel. Well, Jacob was. But none of those fathers were under the law. Only Jacob was Israel. Abraham was not circumcised when he got the promise. They were justified by faith. You're justified by faith, can be saved through Jesus Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ, because you are Christ's. You're in his body, which makes you a part of the child of promise, right? The son of God, the child of God, which is the same argument Paul uses in Romans 8. Okay, the mystery of Christ. You are fellow heirs with Christ. The NIV says with Israel, and what a mistake that is. That's not even in the Greek. This might be the exception that I bring up the Greek here in the lessons. It's so terrible. Ephesians 3, verse 6, the mystery in the NIV, it says, your fellow heirs with Israel. It's like, it's not even in the Greek. Why'd you put that there? It's a total interpretation and a wrong one at that. Because it's not Israel. It messes up the whole gospel. Your fellow heirs with Christ. Because he's the promised child of Abraham. You're according to the heir of promise because you are Christ's. You're a fellow heir with Christ and the same body of Christ, partakers of the gospel in Christ. That's the mystery. Here's three verse six. So it's not as hard as you might think. All right. Abraham's seed? Yeah. Christ was Abraham's seed, and you're in him. Amen. That's correct. And we have an inheritance, not because of what we've done, not because of our flesh, not because of our works, but because we're in Christ, and he gives us an inheritance. We're fellow heirs. And might I trigger some people? We're joint heirs. Okay? Because of Christ, as him and I are heirs together. And so Galatians 3. Verse 29 then, we inherit the things of Christ, not Abraham. It's according to grace, not law. All right. So Romans 4, we can conclude that chapter then where Paul says, it wasn't to him only that God talked about this, 
Romans 4 in verse uh, 23. It was written not only for his sake alone that righteousness was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe. Right? So Abraham, it was counted righteousness because he believed, right? Paul says that wasn't just written for him, it was written for you. Isn't that fun? I thought right division means you rip out the other parts of your Bible. No. A lot of the scripture is for you. In fact, all of the scripture is for you. Not all of it's written to or about you. You say, well, he's saying that Genesis 15, 7 is to you also. It shall be imputed righteousness by faith. Look what the last end of the verse says. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Did Abraham believe that? No. What you believe is different. That he believed was the same. That you get God's blessing and righteousness, just like Abraham as far as God's blessing, yes. That you have to believe what God said, yes. What you're believing is what changed. Yeah. And that just makes sense. I mean, if faith is in the word of God and God's revealed more words, then that's a different thing. Yeah. Right? But the principle is there. So we believe Jesus our Lord, uh, he raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You're justified not by Abraham's circumcision covenant or his works. You're justified by Christ, Amen. by faith, because he died and rose for you. Comments or questions?